Well, hi everyone, this is Bob the Science Guy, and today I want to talk about something that I haven't thought about in a long time, and that is the gas laws. So, let's go ahead and have a look at what we mean by the ideal gas law. Now, an ideal gas has got several properties that make it more of a theoretical than an actual thing. For example, all collisions between gas molecules are considered perfectly elastic, they don't generate any heat, and there's no forces acting on the system. But as we'll see, it's not quite as useful for things like the atmosphere, which is not an ideal gas. So the ideal gas law says that the pressure in the volume of a gas equals nRT. Now, n is the amount of gas, specifically in moles. R is the gas constant, and T, of course, is the temperature. Now, like any algebraic equation, we can manipulate this to control for certain variables. So, for example, if we want to rearrange this a little bit, we can take nr, which are constants, and set them equal to the pressure times the volume over the temperature. Now what's useful about this is that we can take an initial state of a gas and compare it to the same gas in, under different conditions, because they're both equal to the same constant. So we get P, P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2, and this is called the combined gas law. Pretty simple, right? Now another thing that we can do is that we can say that we're going to hold some of these factors stable. So for example with Boyle's law, we take pressure 1 times volume 1 equals nRT, we hold temperature stable, and that will equal pressure 2 times volume 2. So with Boyle's law we use this to relate changes in volume and pressure without a change in temperature. Likewise with Charles' law, we can hold the pressure stable and simply change the volume and temperature. So if we have a certain amount of gas at a certain pressure and it's at one volume at one temperature, if we change either the volume or the temperature, we can calculate what the other value will be. So, for example, if we take a volume of gas at a certain temperature and increase the temperature, what's the resulting volume? Likewise, we can hold the volume stable and look at the relationship between pressure and temperature at two different states of the same gas. So, for example, we can have gas at a certain pressure and temperature. We can increase the pressure and see what the resulting temperature is. Now, the other day I was listening to a Flat Earth discussion channel and one of the uh, Flurf Daddies came on, and when the Glover talked about the pressure gradient in the atmosphere, he came out and said, well, doesn't the air get colder as you go higher up? You ever hear of something called the Guy Lussac's Law? Well, as a matter of fact, I have, and it doesn't help you, Nathan. So let's go ahead and have a quick look at it. Now, just to refresh our memory, the Guy Lussac's Law relates the pressure and temperature of a certain volume of gas to another pressure and temperature of that same volume. Let's look at something here. This is called standard temperature and pressure. So standard temperature and pressure is 29.92 inches of mercury and 15 degrees Celsius, which equals 288 Kelvin. Let's go ahead and take this up 10,000 feet. Now Nathan is absolutely correct. As you go up, the temperature goes down. How much? two degrees Celsius for every thousand feet. I know we're mixing units a little bit, but that's the way I learned it and that's the way I'm comfortable with it. So if we went up 10,000 feet from sea level at standard temperature and pressure, what would the resulting temperature be? Well, it would be two times 10 because it's two degrees for every thousand lower. So instead of being 288 Kelvin, it will be 268 Kelvin. Let's go ahead and calculate the pressure according to the guy with Sachs law. Okay, so if we go up 10,000 feet, we're going to go down 20 degrees Celsius. So P1 is 29.92 inches of mercury. T1 is 288 Kelvin. Okay, P2 is what we're looking for. And T2 equals 268 Kelvin. Okay, let's go ahead and do the math real quick. So the formula is P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. Now, what do we have? Well, we have P1, we have T1, and we have T2. We want to solve for P2. 
So all we have to do is just multiply both sides by T2. That'll drop this out and we'll end up with P1 T2 over T1. And that will equal P2. So let's go ahead and do the math. So first what we'll do is we'll go ahead and put in our values. Okay, so this is in inches of mercury. This is in Kelvin and that is in Kelvin. So the units will drop out here and our answer will be in inches of mercury. So what's that work out to? 27.84 inches of mercury. So according to the guy sachs law, the fact that we go from sea level to 10,000 feet will cause the temperature to drop 20 degrees Celsius and it'll cause the pressure to drop approximately two inches of mercury. However, is that what we actually see? Well, no, it's not. Now, while you can easily verify this with a simple Google search, I went ahead and put a citation from the Department of Natural Resources in Wisconsin on correcting barometric pressure. It states very clearly that barometric pressure in our atmosphere drops one inch of mercury for every thousand feet of altitude. So given the sea level pressure of 29.92 inches of mercury at 10,000 feet, that should be 19.92 inches of mercury, not 27. So Nathan, why doesn't this work out according to Guy Lussac's? It's because we have an external force called gravity acting on the atmosphere causing a pressure gradient. This is not something that you see in an ideal gas because there by definition is no external force acting on that gas in order for these calculations to work correctly. So even though you heard of something called the Guy Lussac's law, apparently you don't know how to use it because if you did, you wouldn't be claiming that was the cause of our pressure gradient in the atmosphere. So this is Bob the Science Guy, once again, extracting those flat earth tears for fun and education. Take care, everybody.